Actually, I think they should use this picture in health class. We should uh, send this out to, <laughs> to, to the schools. You know, basically let the kids come in, put this up on the screen, let them kind of get seated, let it burn into their minds, you know, and then just, it's simple, really. The whole thing is, is really simple. It's like, yeah, you guys can go ahead and do that, but then that. That's it. You know what I mean? Well, can we kiss? Can we touch? Can we hug? Yes, you can touch one another, but then that leads to that, and that leads to that. You know what I mean? Like, why would you want to do that? You know, like, so I don't know. Well, you know, I, I wanted to uh, put the price of that thing. I thought it would sell for like 50 bucks, but I think it went for $8. Is that what it went for? Eight, eight dollars, you know. But then I realized it is a ministry. We're trying to meet people's needs. Apparently someone needed to get dressed up as a pink flamingo. I'm going to stop now <laughs> because there's a few other jokes. And if you thought it, that's on you, not me. <clears throat> um, so did I. <laughs> you were warned. His wife told him. You put that on there. It's going to be up on a giant screen on Sunday. He's like, okay, I'm going to do it. Fine. I hear that. <laughs> Dare me. <clears throat> you got to. <sighs> don't encourage me. I don't need it at all. Change the picture. Change it. <laughs> Change it. There we go. <laughs> I would not have been able to stop. <laughs> it was going to keep going, too. Uh, all right. Father's Day. It is Father's Day. We won't think about the picture. I want to give some of you encouragement this morning. Father's Day is a celebration for many of us, but you have to think about it. When you're a pastor, things come to your attention. It's also a sad day for some. Some are grieving the loss of their dad. Some didn't have such a great relationship with their fathers. So I want to encourage you this morning, no matter what your relationship is or was with your earthly father, you have a heavenly father in whom we put all of our hope through Jesus Christ. Amen? The only hope I have in being a good earthly father is through the Holy Spirit's leading. That's it. I can't do it on my own. If I go on and put my identity as a father first, as a husband first, I'm going to fail. I put my identity in Christ above all things, and then I can love with the heart of Jesus. When our identity is in Christ, everything else falls into place. So today we put aside all of our earthly identities and we come to worship our Heavenly Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the unity of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And I just wanted to make a note, because as I was worshiping this morning, I had a thought, <clears throat> because to so many, so much of this is so black and white. You know, it has to be just that or just that. And worship is both. How does Jesus say, ultimately, we worship? Spirit and truth. What's the most important command? We love God. And the other one is, like it. <laughs> loving each other. Loving each other. Sacrifice, Romans 12. Sacrifice, living as a living sacrifice is a form of worship. This is your spiritual worship. That's what the Word of God says. Loving one another. Paul in his letters, he says, edification, everything in the church should be done for building each other up with psalms, songs, spiritual hymns, songs, whatever. It doesn't matter. Love, edification, building up. It's a form of worship. So yeah, there's high praise. There are those songs when we come in and we are unashamedly praising the name of Jesus. But Jesus says, love one another. Matthew 7, 12. This is the law and the prophets. That's a powerful statement. Treating others the way you want to be treated is the law and the prophets. Look it up. Love, 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 love. So as we were worshiping this morning, I felt built up. I felt loved, you know? Like, it's not about the worship singers. It's not about me. I'm just a tool. I'm just a mouthpiece this morning. I'm just repeating what I already read in the Bible. 
trying to let the Holy Spirit guide me a little bit, try to be a little flexible in the service. And so this morning, I felt built up. You know, we have some really good singers, and sometimes that can be a bad thing in certain environments because, you know, we're, we're paying too much attention to the singers. But I felt this morning during worship, truths being sung to us. I felt our people being built up and edified. So it was really a beautiful thing this morning. And I think we can applaud that. <laughs> I think we can say that's good. That's good, okay? So an encouragement to you this morning, don't, don't, don't be afraid <laughs> to let them build you up, to let people share an encouraging word. It's all a part of the worship. Right? So it's not just like, okay, we are worshiping now while we sing and talk about Jesus, and then we are not worshiping. No, 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 no. It, it's all worship. <laughs> when we love one another, it's the, from the minute you come in the door, it's worship. You're loving one another. Hi, good morning, I love you, good to see you. There you go, that's it. You don't have to stop when you leave the church. <laughs> you can love your neighbors. Continue to worship, right? Continue to glorify God in all the things that you do. So, we are a Bible-believing church. That is the reference for everything we do. Christ is the head. We are the body. Holy Spirit does the leading. God does the talking. If you want to know more about what that looks like, how we do things, I'm going to encourage you to come to Growth Track today. You've probably heard about it. If you're new, maybe you haven't. We're going to be doing it twice a month, and that sounds a little crazy because, yes, it gets a little slow here during the summer, but even if it's just one person, I don't care. I don't want people to be waiting a whole month just to get information or ask me questions. So Growth Track is where you can ask me questions. It's also where I try to pre-answer all of the questions you might have about the church. Also let you know where you can get plugged in, how you can get plugged in as the body of Christ here. So we have potluck today. We'll feed you. You can go upstairs. 15, 20 minutes later, we'll come down here. Growth track is like 20 minutes. I try to keep it really short. All right, nothing like my sermon. Um, <laughs> also, on the app, <clears throat> you can use that. If you can't stay, whatever, it's, it's Father's Day, so maybe you have lunch. If you can't stay, you can go through the app. And if you swipe, no instructions, but I did just tell you, you'll find an About Us section. And some of those questions are answered in there. We want you to be well informed. Also, you can catch up on sermons if you miss church. I hope you're watching the sermons. If you're new, maybe you saw them online and you came in. That's crazy. Um, but you can watch the sermons right through the app there. And we've had some interesting weeks. We've been talking about a lot of tough topics. Last week, Dr. Dane, he talked about sex inside and outside the marriage covenant. Okay, so what is it for? Well, one flesh Consummate the marriage, that's okay. Procreate, have children for pleasure too. He made us really uncomfortable with Song of Solomon or Song of Songs. <laughs> he taught us how to make babies from biblical scripture. That was weird. And I'll never look at a cluster of grapes the same way ever again. So that's ruined <laughs> completely. <laughs> but Carolee and David did a great job at being transparent. You want to know what real church, real people looks like? That. That's what it looks like. It looks like two young people sharing their hearts. Hey, look, we didn't always do it right. We don't always get it right. I don't always get it right. But look, church, help me out. Right? Like Heather said, help, <laughs> the four-letter word. So they did. They came to Pastor Wayne for help, and we helped them. And so now they're in a good place, right? So not always going to be perfect, and I encourage, especially the younger couples and stuff, we're here for you. No, it's, it's, it's not always going to be sunshine and rainbows. It's not this morning. Uh, maybe we'll get a rainbow later. Uh, but life is tough. We want to be real about that. But we want to get you in godly alignment where we can, right? The week before that, money. <laughs> Talked about money. I just basically said, let's just do all the tough topics straight in a row and get it over with, you know. So we're talking about money. But in the context of living generously, Right? No, you don't have to tithe. There's nowhere in the Bible that says modern day, New Testament, Christians in a modern church context that you have to tithe. Oh, but 10% is a pretty good idea. It's like taking a Sabbath, right? It's a good idea. Take a day off. Honor God. Honor your family. So giving 10%, setting that as a baseline is a good old idea. I told you even, showed you some examples about how even in the secular world, it's a good idea. It also helps to nourish the body of Christ. We have a lot of things that we want to do for our community right around us and abroad. We've got plans. We need your help getting them done. So we've got to nourish the body of Christ. Also, it's parting with something that, look, if we're all being really honest, it's probably just a little bit too important to us. 
You know, we're holding on to it a little too tight. So it's honoring God. The right attitude about it was what? It's not giving up 10%. It's keeping 90% in reality. It's never ours to begin with. You can't take it with you. Then we were in Philippians. Quite appropriately, Philippians is the greatest thank you note of all time ever written. Paul the Apostle writes to the church in Philippi to thank them for their generosity. They gave him a gift while he's in prison. And he's saying thank you, but he doesn't just stop there. There's some great theology in that letter. Beautiful Jesus gospel poem in there is the center, the heart of the letter. He encourages them. He says, be like me. Be like Epaphroditus and Timothy, right? We're trying to be like Jesus. So that was the encouragement, living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ and what that really looks like. Beautiful letter by Paul the Apostle who wrote much of the New Testament. And that brings us to our Jesus League series. <clears throat> As a Bible-believing church, we want you to understand the Bible. So this series, we're going to try to accomplish that in the New Testament anyway. We're going to look at the human co-authors, so to speak, of the Bible. Why do I say co-authors? Because these are divinely inspired books. It's the Word of God. Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. These men are just being guided by him in their writings. Man and God working together. It's a beautiful thing. I think a while back I did that Escher drawing. Everybody's probably seen it. The hands writing the hands. It's kind of one way to think about it. It's just beautiful. So our focus, though, will be on the New Testament. It's just going to be the people witnessing to Jesus. So the Old Testament, it stops at Malachi about four to 500 years before the New Testament is written, and that is written over a period of time in a witness period between 20 and 100 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. And so to give you an idea of where we're going to be. Each book has a particular audience and some major themes. We're going to look at those too. And we'll see that who the writer is has an influence on the flavor of the book, the style of the writing. We saw that in Philippians. Understanding these writers is like understanding the superhero movies. <laughs> That's why we kind of did this. All right, so my daughter loves the superhero movies. She's like, Dad, don't talk about me in church again, but I'm going to. So she watches all these movies. She knows the characters, so she knows what's going on and then talks about it and talks about it and talks about it and talks about it while I'm trying to watch the movie and then I don't know what's going on, so forget it. But, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, she knows about the characters. She knows the behind the scenes. So when she watches these movies, she gets what's going on. You know, she knows why someone would be doing something, who they're connected to, the motivation. She spoils the ending, you know, that kind of thing. So we hope to accomplish this with this series in a similar way. So this would be like only seeing the Justice League movie, right? Then going back and watching the Wonder Woman movie, the Superman movies, and the Batman movies. Gosh, I hope those are all DC. So, <laughs> did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, I'm still not a cool dad. But anyway, <laughs> once you watched all of those movies, you would go back to the Justice League movie where they all come together, and I'm not going to let Sophie explain it to you right now. But they all come together, and you'd go, oh, that's what's going on, or that's why this person did this, and that's why that person did that, and that's why this person said, or they're mad at that. So you get it. We're going to try to do that. We're going to try to take a better look that the writers of the New Testament, their interactions with each other, who they are, will get the who, what, when, where, why, connect the dots in this series. So this morning, we're going to watch a short video of our overseer, Pastor Wayne. I want to say this just in case you're new. I've said this before when we watched a video. We're not a satellite church. We're not a video church. I do the, the most of the teaching here. I do the Wednesday night Bible studies unless I'm out of town. So... I'm the primary teacher here as your lead pastor, but just like in the New Testament, they had these letters, and then they would read them aloud in the churches. We have video, so it's really cool. We get to see our overseer, Pastor Wayne. That might bring up questions about how we do leadership. It's in the app, or go to Growth Track. I'm going to encourage you to do that. First book of the New Testament is Matthew. So let's watch this video on Matthew from our overseer, Pastor Wayne. Good morning, and welcome Today, we continue our series, The Jesus League. We read their letters. We hear their stories. But who were these people that Jesus gathered around him? Today, we look at Matthew. Understand, 
that Matthew was a guy like most any other. He had bills to pay, lived in a house. He ordered pizza on Friday nights. Okay, maybe he didn't have pizza on Friday nights, but you get the point. Matthew, before he was designated Saint Matthew, was just plain old Matthew. And it was years after he became a disciple of Jesus Christ that Matthew wrote a book. Matthew's account of the gospel is the first book of the New Testament. And throughout the book, we see Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. And from the calling of the disciples, through the parables, all the way to the Great Commission, this New Testament book shows readers how the prophecies and promises God made to his people in the Old Testament come to pass through Jesus of Nazareth. Matthew's primary audience was Jewish. So, naturally, he quotes over 50 Old Testament verses and honors his Jewish readers who did not like to directly use the name of God by being the only gospel account that changes the phrase the kingdom of God to the kingdom of heaven. Still, Matthew is anything but a legalistic perfectionist. As foreboding as that moral demands of the kingdom may be, for example, Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew marries that with forgiveness. Forgiveness is a constant companion for Matthew. We read in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, For if you forgive people their wrongdoing, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. And while Matthew pulls no punches when he records Jesus speaking of the realities of heaven and hell, Matthew is also quick to point out that how we treat others and not merely how we keep the law will have an effect on our ultimate destination. Matthew 25, verse 31 and following. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. But to the ones on his left, to the others, he says, I assure you, whatever you did not do, for the least of these, you did not do for me either. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And yet there's more. Matthew also shows the many ways Jesus surprised the Jews, welcoming everyone into this upside down kingdom where the unlikely become important. Matthew's call to discipleship is a case in point. Check it out. Matthew 9, verse 9 and following. 
As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he got up and followed him. While Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came as guests to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, tax collectors are mentioned many times in the New Testament. They were hated by the Jews of Jesus' day because, well, of their perceived greed and collaboration with the Romans. And as I noted in what I just read, in the eyes of the religious leaders, tax collectors were sinners. And yet Jesus called Matthew the sinner to prominence. As a disciple of Jesus, Matthew began to see life differently. That the life he had been living needed to be flipped upside down. Leaders need to serve. Those who give up everything for Jesus somehow gain everything. The perspective that Matthew gained and we now gain from reading the words that he wrote. It's not merely theological or theoretical. Rather, Matthew's words are rife with real life experience of this upside down kingdom promised hundreds and even thousands of years before the time of Jesus. In his writing, Matthew is careful to honor the Old Testament and the law. Yet he is also quick to point out that Jesus came to directly fulfill the law. Matthew 5, 17 says, Don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. This new understanding is critical for Matthew because the book of Matthew is not merely about Jesus. You see, Matthew invites us into this story of how the good news of Jesus had a profound impact on the lives of many. People who were irreligious, people who were marginalized, People who were unimportant and castaways through faith in Jesus were transformed. And in this sense, Matthew not only invites us to read his story, but also to live our own story of transformation. Wouldn't you like to be transformed? Wouldn't you like to no longer struggle with the things that you don't talk about at parties? Wouldn't you like to set those things down, not just for a day, not even for a week only, but to truly be transformed so that those things never impact you again? Wouldn't you like that? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. And look, new things have come. The transformation you see is more radical than we might first imagine. We look at caterpillars turning into butterflies and tadpoles turning into frogs and call it transformation. But this is only a shadow of what real transformation is. Yes. The caterpillar changes on the outside, but it still has the same DNA. 
The tadpole changes on the outside, but it still has the same DNA. Real transformation. The kind Paul and Matthew are writing about means that everything about us changes. How we live our lives, what we think is important, our goals, our hopes, our fears, they all are transformed. Matthew's words reach beyond the page and out to your heart today. Will you be transformed by the grace and love offered by Jesus? Will you embrace the upside-down kingdom of heaven? You take a moment and you ponder that.